What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. Amron, and we just had maybe one of the better NFL Sundays of the season. Now, there wasn't any crazy game that sticked out in my mind, but we had a lot of upsets. We had a lot of crazy things from a fantasy football perspective. Now, a lot of players did bust, and everything was like kind of unpredictable. And I see people on Twitter like complaining about the week. For me personally, like the randomness of the game is the best part of the NFL and fantasy football. Now, with that being said, today is one of my favorite videos to make because we come out here and I give you guys my top 10 lessons learned, takeaways, observations where I can sit down and just talk about football, fantasy football, just things that I saw on the gridiron, on the football field. Now, with that being said, we put out daily content. We're doing, I want to say we're going to get eight or nine videos up this week. So we put out a lot of content to help you guys win your fantasy football leagues. Make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. And with that being said, let's get into my top 10 lessons learned for week 10 or top 10 lessons learned from week nine for week 10 of the fantasy football season. Let's go. Thirsty, thirsty, try to choose. I mean, I know I'm pretty cool. My nitty bag. My All right. First up, we're going to kind of go in chronological order. We're going to talk about first up. My first lesson learned or takeaway from the Thursday night game. Jonathan Taylor should probably be the RB1 across all formats. Standard, 0.5 PPR, PPR, rest of season rankings, dynasty rankings, all of that. The dude is balling out of his goddamn mind. He just put up, I know it's the Jets, I know it's the Jets, but he put up 19 carries for 172 rushing yards and two touchdowns. 172 rushing yards on 19 carries is just absurd like the guy is just like he is I don't think it's wild to say he is up there you know like Derrick Henry when he's healthy but in terms of like the best pure rushes in the league I think that it, it, it is Derrick Henry Nick Chubb and Jonathan Taylor I think Jonathan Taylor is now up in that tier he's insane and from a fantasy perspective what he's been doing as of recently since those first three weeks now if you guys remember we do a little rewind first three weeks i was saying by jonathan taylor by jonathan taylor he's getting the goal line carries he's getting all the usage that he needs marlon mack is going to be a healthy scratch for most games going forward now fast forward to here since week four he is the rb1 averaging 25.7 ppr points per game that is that legendary upside that we were talking about in the early offseason we were talking about legendary upside we want ppr points per game over like 22 23 and that's where you get to that you know christian mccaffrey todd Gurley. now obviously christian mccaffrey in like 2018 2019 todd Gurley in 2017 kind of alvin kamara in 2020 Le'Veon bell in like 2016 2015 david johnson in 2015 those running back seasons are how you can literally just screw up everywhere else and still win your fantasy championship like if you just limped your way into the championship last year with alvin kamara he single-handedly won you your league and the reason why I was so firm on Jonathan now hold on it's not a foregone conclusion that he is a legendary running back yet it's just that he can he can produce that kind of output is what we're seeing now it's going we're going to see at the end of the year when we look at his win rates we look at his points per game at the end of the season if he was a legendary running back but I think the process for thinking that he could be was sound now I, I was saying that I thought he could be a legendary running back because of elite efficiency people were saying he didn't catch enough passes and he doesn't catch enough passes but the elite efficiency is what gets you there right kind of like what a what a Dalvin Cook can do and kind of like what a Todd Gurley Todd Gurley isn't the same as Le'Veon Bell David Johnson and Christian McCaffrey all guys that can have you know like 100 plus targets in a given season he wins there on touchdowns and efficiency and Jonathan Taylor is insanely efficient he has four 100 yard rushing games since week four he has 20 plus points in five out of six of those games the crazy part is, is that he's only playing on like 70 percent of the snaps and his rushing yard over expectation insanity rushing yards over expected is just how many yards you were expected to gain and then how many yards you exceeded that by on a per attempt basis he is averaging 1.9 yards over expected on a per attempt basis which is insane and when you look at the rest of the field these are all of the people or all of the players with over one. So just having one one rushing yard over expectation per attempt is elite company. He only six players are on this list. The crazy part is that he is at 1.9. Nick Chubb is only at 1.57. That's a huge gap. That same gap, I guess I'll try and do this off the top of my head. What is that? Three gets it to six. So 0.33, the same gap between one and two is the same gap between two and 
it's actually not that big but still when you when you take into account that only six players have over one rushing yard over expected per attempt and he has almost double that and he is you know 0.33 yards ahead of second place like it, it's crazy how efficient he is and that's kind of what the thesis was now when we talk about him going forward as the rb1 rest of season we have aaron jones and Alvin Kamara are getting dinged in their usage. Mark Ingram, for whatever reason, Sean Payton loves Mark Ingram. It seems like if I'm just, you know, just kind of talking from what I saw, Trevor Simeon didn't look great yesterday. I think that we could see Taysom Hill moving forward, so that hurts Alvin Kamara. Aaron Jones gets a little bit dinged by A.J. Dillon. A.J. Dillon has looked really good, and he saw a lot of passing down work yesterday. I want to say he had four catches out of the backfield for like 44 yards. Both of their usage are, are, are trending down. We have Davin Cook, who has been great but he hasn't been as efficient as a Jonathan Taylor I think he's actually been inefficient this year then we have Austin Eckler who has been great I think you can make it the case for Jonathan Taylor Austin Eckler or Dalvin Cook but I would just say the way that Jonathan Taylor has been playing especially given the fact that he has the third easiest remaining schedule for fantasy running backs according to PFF I think that he is you know I'm not saying he's the definitive RB1 rest of season, but I think that you could make the case. And as of this week, I think I will be putting him at RB1 in my rest of season rankings that will be available on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. Now, our second takeaway of the day is a beautiful one. I don't know whose quote this is. I think it's like the like commissioner from like the 1940s for the NFL. But on any given Sunday, any team can beat another team. And that's beautiful. You know, this was a wild Sunday. From a real football perspective, we had, you know, the Denver Broncos. They were 10-point dogs. They lost to the Cowboys, 30-16. to 16. We had the Jaguars, 15.5-point dogs, lose to the Bills, 9-6. to 6. We had the Rams down Derrick Henry, 7-point underdogs, and they handled the Rams pretty easily, 28-16. to 16. You know, anything can happen on any given Sunday, and it's kind of just a reminder, reminder that, yes, I do all this prep leading into the, into the week to, you know, give you guys the best information possible, right? So I'm, I'm reading up on team totals and spreads, but football is so unpredictable and it's played on such a small sample that it's impossible, man. Like as much as, you know, we look at the team totals that, okay, the total should hover around here. And, you know, the, this team should beat this team by about a touchdown. And on the end of the day, when, you know, the ball is snapped at 1 p.m., what happens those next seven hours is a shit show. Like anything, anything can really happen. So as much as we use that, as a guide for like what to expect on a week-to-week -week basis we also have to remember that we're operating with a lot of margin of error you know what i mean it's kind of just a humbling experience i know a lot of people out there on twitter as I, I mentioned it earlier but a lot of people were like kind of mad that like you know players didn't live up to their expectations and like it was just like a very wonky week but you know everyone is getting hit with that you know what i mean so it's so whatever I, I kind of i kind of prefer like a very hectic week like this which also brings us to that rams titans game which was weird it was kind of wonky like i said the titans won that game pretty it just it never felt like the rams uh, ever since the early on when stafford threw he threw two picks i think i think he threw back-to-back -back picks it was the one pick on like the the goal line essentially to avoid the safety and then he had the pick six so since then it just like the game i wouldn't say out of hand but they just like you know it was a pretty convincing win and the titans are a team i wanted to just talk about right so my third takeaway is just Let's sift through this new look Titans and just kind of what we're dealing with here. And with the Titans, the backfield isn't super clear. That's that's one of my main takeaways is that we we kind of underestimated Deontay Foreman's usage. McNichols, I, I'm not going to sit here and like victory lap 26 snaps, but I was thinking that McNichols was going to lead this, this backfield and he did, but not to the point where he's like a startable RB2 moving forward or anything. He saw about 50% of the snaps. He saw less than 50% of the opportunities, but like right around that 40% range. Then you had Adrian Peterson, who had no juice at all. He had 10 carries for 21 yards and a touchdown. His longest run was six yards on 10 carries. He had a 2.1 yards per carry. The touchdown essentially saved him for fantasy football purposes. And then when you look from a rushing perspective, Deontay Foreman might have been their best running back yesterday. So Deontay Foreman is funny that he he was 100 with the team nobody's really talking about him but he was a really fun prospect coming out of texas he had a ton of production at texas he was prolific at a run at a young age he kills the combine he has like size speed like he was a prospect i really liked but he tore his achilles and i will say 
side takeaway. I'll give you guys this bonus takeaway. I think I'm going to start buying into the idea that torn Achilles aren't the end of the world anymore um, with modern medicine. I, the guy, uh, if you guys saw him, Keenan Wangwu, the, uh, the Vikings backup running. He's a third string, fourth string type running back. He was the kick returner. He returned the kick 100 yards for a touchdown. Now, he tore his Achilles like in college, so maybe like three, four years ago. So we're a lot, we're, we're very far removed from that injury. Same thing with Deontay Foreman towards Achilles. Now I'm not going to take Deontay Foreman's five for 29 performance and say, you know what? Achilles injuries aren't a big deal, but I think we're getting to a, a spot where it's not as much as a dense sentence as it once was. If you guys have seen the Cam Akers videos, he has looked really, really good in those individual drills, but Deontay Foreman had five for 29, 5.8 yards per carry. Uh, AP only had a 2.1 yards per carry and McNichols only had like a 3.4. Now, yards per carry is an imperfect stat. It sucks. That's why we use rushing yards over expected, right? When I was talking about Jonathan Taylor, the thing is on such a small sample, you can't look at over expected. And when everyone's on the same, you know, in the same backfield, I think yards per carry isn't a terrible stat to look at, right? Because if you, if you compare Jonathan Taylor to Nick Chubb and use yards per carry, not the move. But if you want to compare Nick Chubb to Kareem Hunt within that backfield, they're both behind the same offensive line and a lot of the same situations yards per carry isn't the end of the world if we're talking about a really small sample and like i said deontay foreman had the most juice of them all now do i think that he just you know completely sidesteps you know adrian peterson and adrian peterson becomes a third string back probably not they seem like kind of tied to adrian peterson which is weird for a guy they just picked up off the streets i think if they were the most optimal way to use this backfield if i was the head coach would be to make ap the third string back that only comes in on you know like if someone needs a breather or maybe short yardage situations but i would keep him you know as a third string guy and then deontay Foreman would be my banger between the tackles and i would have jeremy mcnichols on passing downs kind of like a chase edmonds um james connor kind of thing or like an aaron jones aj dylan thing i don't think that's how it's going to be i think it's probably going to be a three-man rotation until something you know until someone truly truly emerges here here so i would say moving forward i don't i think that none of them can be like a a top 30 type start you know rb2 type start they're all going to be you know fringe rb3 type plays mcnichols is the most valuable moving forward just because he had the most touches and the most passing down work now when we zoom out from the backfield and just look at the overall offense my my hope was is without derrick henry that they would skew to the pass more which would really help aj brown and it's a really small sample size but it's trending that way and what I mean by that is in neutral passing down situations, so this is the first three quarters, no garbage time, no like third and long. So just in neutral situations where you can run or pass, none of them is implied that you have to do either. They pass the ball 44.2% of the time in neutral situations since 2019. That was good for last in the league since that time. Vrabel's been there. Derrick Henry's been there since 2019 week nine this week remember we're talking about a small sample size really small sample size but in the neutral situations in this game tonight they passed the ball in 55.6 percent of snaps which was like i think 12th in the league like a whole 11 percent increase from their usual pass rate now Tannehill didn't have like a, a stupid amount of attempts because the game they had a largely positive game script where they could just run the ball and not have to pass the ball down by any points but we have some kind of encouragement that in neutral situations, they're going to be passing the ball a little bit more than they have in the past, which overall leads to, you know, they're not going to always be in positive game scripts. They're probably going to be more neutral negative. So that opens them up for more pass attempts. And on a really small, uh, on one game with AJ Brown, without Derrick Henry this year, he saw 42% of the targets. Now, I don't think that Derrick Henry has much to do with that. It's probably more of like a Julio Jones thing, but still 42% target share. They're passing the ball more in neutral situations. This is all really good for AJ Brown, even though AJ Brown only gave you five catches for 42 yards, 11 targets on the day is still really good. I have him still locked and loaded as a top five wide receiver rest of season. Our number four takeaway on the day. It's that Brian Edwards probably isn't going to happen, fellas. I know a lot of people out there were really high on him and he's not a guy that I like because he qualifies as a face planner. So these guys that really don't do well in year one, usually bust. Usually. I say usually because we do have guys, Michael Porter Jr. or Michael Pittman Jr. was the guy that I really missed on. We had a guy in DJ Chark that was uh, someone that face planted year one and did well. Those guys are the exception to the rule, not like the rule themselves. We had other guys that were in this category of face planners this year um henry ruggs brian edwards jalen rager denzel mims all of them haven't panned out this year now 
even before the whole rugs incident he only had like 11 percent target share he wasn't like breaking out to become this like michael Pittman, like why does she every week why does she were two type guy and yesterday with no rugs it was, i was hearing all over the place oh it's supposed to be the brian edwards breakout game and the problem with brian edwards is that he doesn't command a lot of targets and that's what i'm looking for from these wide receivers from like a you know a prospect dynasty type perspective he only has an 11.5 percent target share on the season he only saw four targets yesterday no henry rugs he turned in zero catches for zero yards against a giant secondary that was really keying in on darren waller i think that they had james bradbury on darren waller at a certain point if brian edwards was supposed to be this alpha wide receiver really good he would be out here balling now i did like brian edwards as a prospect because his breakout age was crazy he broke out as like a 17 year old freshman alongside like debo samuel hayden hurst the problem is is that he stayed for four years so not being an early declare hurts you a lot as a wide receiver and then also he never had like a, a height like it, he had four years he broke out as a young age but i don't think he ever passed like a thousand yards receiving in college now i'm being broad because i usually use like dominator rating and all that stuff i can't think of it on top of my head but he wasn't a an exceptional prospect if that makes sense despite having like a wild breakout age like one of the youngest i've ever seen but regardless when you see a guy like rugs miss miss time or whatever that doesn't just mean the next wide receiver is going to have like a breakout game and step up a lot of these guys like targets are earned not given so if if you remove a player doesn't mean that like the next player up is going to be amazing like if you remove chase claypool james washington doesn't, doesn't become a stud uh, we we talked about this in the offseason that's kind of just how it is with the running backs not the wide receivers now i have said like okay juju smith schuster is gone claypool is going to get more targets that works when we're talking about routes right because he got more routes we've we've seen we've seen him earn a lot of targets on a per route basis he's just been needing more snaps then okay juju leaving means chase claypool upgrade if that makes sense so I think it's time to pour one out for Brian Ayuk and then, or Brian Edwards. And then our fifth lesson learned is that it's time to pour up for Brandon Ayuk. He's finally showing some life. And I think the resurrection is happening here. Everybody out there, the Ayuk faithful, I know a lot of you guys are riding with him. I just moved him up the dynasty rankings before I made this video. I, I did the, the sweep of the dynasty rankings on Friday. I had him at like wide receiver 31 just because he hasn't shown us any life man but i've moved him up to wide receiver 24 in my dynasty rankings after yesterday's game and i know it's just one game but i just needed him to show me something because i do genuinely think regardless of what's going on with the 49ers i genuinely think that he is a very good football player and that matters he is a really really talented football player will he be you know a wide receiver one in this offense with kittle and debo probably not but i think that they are i think simply you know, Debo can be doing all that he's doing, but that doesn't mean that Ayuk isn't talented as well. I think Ayuk, Kittle, and Debo are all very talented wide receivers. And in Dynasty, when we're talking about long-term, I just want to have the good players, and that's all that matters. Everything else will shake out. Debo could get traded. He could sign with somebody else. I want to say Debo's contract is up soon. You know, Ayuk could get traded. There's a billion things that can happen in the NFL. But when we talk about Ayuk yesterday, he saw season highs last week. So if you look at the, the tweet that uh smola is quote tweeting week eight he saw season highs in snap share route rate and target share this week after having seven targets four catches for 45 yards last week this week he sets a season high in snap rate he still had a really good route rate really good target share he set a season high in targets catches and yards turning in eight targets six catches 89 yards and a touchdown and is currently top 12 in the week for scoring You'll love to see it. You'll love to see it. Ayuk is doing big things. And it's the biggest thing is, is that Kyle Shanahan, despite how much he loves to put people in the doghouse, Ayuk had a really bad fumble. I love Ayuk, but he had a fumble. He goes like down the field. He catches it. I think he like rolls over. He's on the ground. He gets back up. And then I think it's Byron Murphy comes from behind and like punches out the ball. Bad fumble. Kyle Shanahan didn't put him in the doghouse. Instead, he had his highest snap rate of the entire season. So Shanahan trusts him. He he showed that he can still go out there and perform even after getting, you know, getting a fumble early on. So big things to come with, with Ayuk. I really like him moving forward. I think that, I, I, like, I don't think that he is going to be a top 24 wide receiver like I thought beginning of the season. But if he can be, you know, I think he can be like a flex type of play moving forward. Then we have in that same offense that there's a little bit of a misconception or misconception. And it's that Kyle Shanahan uses a committee. I think Kyle Shanahan doesn't actually like to use a committee and here's why i think that uh i pretty much was reading on twitter and shout out to jacob sanderson he was touching on some of the the kyle shanahan stuff but 
Shanahan doesn't actually like to use a committee because like people just think because of how he rotates his running backs, you know, with guys like last year, Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon, Raheem Moser, Jeff Wilson, all having their own little stretches. People think that he's just rotating players and he just kind of goes with like the whims of the wind and just kind of puts whoever in and, you know, in certain games, two players can be effective, but he really only rotates his running back so much because of injuries. I don't know if it's because the way that he runs them with his zone running scheme, but he pretty much just rotates up the next man up. And then the player that he has as his main guy for that game usually just goes crazy and has, you know, a full workload, which is why Jeff Wilson, a guy that a lot of people were scared of for Elijah Mitchell, Jeff Wilson gets activated off of IR. He didn't do anything to hurt Elijah Mitchell. He saw zero snaps yesterday. And what's even more encouraging is that Elijah Mitchell saw the best role of his career or I guess yeah of his of his short career at this point I was going to say like maybe that's a little bit maybe I'm kind of uh, fluffing that up a little bit but he did see the best role of his career Elijah Shanahan or Elijah Mitchell saw you know a workhorse role he saw a majority of the rushes 88.9 percent of the rushes he usually sees around 85 percent but he hit a season high from a receiving standpoint he saw a 12.8 percent target share he I mean 85 percent or 88.9 percent of the rush attempts 12.8% of the targets. I mean, that is, you know, bell cow type stuff. Even with Jeff Wilson, healthy, Trey Sermon was a healthy scratch. They're using him as an all-purpose guy. So anybody out there that's saying, you know, Kyle Shanahan likes to roll with the committee. Jeff Wilson's going to come back. It's going to hurt Elijah Mitchell. They're dead wrong. Also, Elijah Mitchell was a really good receiver in college. He had 20 catches as a sophomore. I don't know why they haven't used him more there. Then we have, oh, didn't mean to put that up. Then we have Javante Williams, stud in the making. Guy is super talented. I keep on moving him with the dynasty rankings. I think he is genuinely the next Jonathan Taylor, Nick Chubb, Ezekiel Elliott level, you know, workhorse RB in the NFL, like a Todd Gurley, again, you know, like a Dalvin Cook, not not so much a McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, Aaron Jones, but that other mold that's really good for fantasy, Chubb, Ezekiel Elliott, Todd Gurley, JT, all of those guys. The guy is just so talented. Just just let's let's just look, look at this run real quick. I, I, I think that this is probably going to come in a little bit choppy for you guys, but just look at look at how insane this was. It's going to come a little bit choppy, but I mean, th- this run is just insane, man. He follows, follows the lead blocker. He takes this whole pile for a ride, keeps the legs turning, gets free. Like, he could have taken that to the house. It- it's insane. It's insane what he does, man. Oh, shit. Now you guys can see uh, a little bit of my outline there. But we have just like an absolute... He's insane. He turned 17 carries into 111 yards rushing the ball he's he's insane now again every time I talk about Javante Williams everyone's got to talk about Melvin Gordon as well I get that Melvin Gordon is there I get that Melvin Gordon out touched him Javante remained efficient across the board against Melvin Gordon now am I saying definitively Javante Williams is going to beat out Melvin Gordon rest of the season no but he has a talent to the point where the coaching staff might just feel like their hand is forced and just you know let him just run and take over, you know, 60% of the opportunity, 70% of the opportunity. And then there we're talking about an absolute stud. Regardless, though, all this takeaway is, is that from a talent perspective, Javante Williams is really, really special, whether that takes into effect this year or just, you know, next year, he is going to be Javante Williams. I think I will say it right now, Javante Williams, if he doesn't, you know, go on a crazy tear at the end of the season, whatever, whatever, if he is available, like in the third round of redraft leagues next year, he will be my DeAndre Swift type running back that I'll be aiming for and hero RB builds in like the third or fourth rounds. I, I love Javante Williams and what he does. Then we have Tyrod Taylor on the Texans means good things for the Brandon Cooks. I think the connection is still there. He saw a ton of targets. Now I think that this is the correct thing that I'm trying to show up. Uh, Brandon Cooks saw 13 targets. Now did he only turn it in for six catches and 56 yards for 11.6 points? Yes, but Tyrod Taylor, his first game back, he's still a little bit rusty, but I really like that the connection is still there and that Tyrod Taylor is a big upgrade from Davis Mills. Brandon Cooks essentially got unlucky again, only 11.6 points, but according to PFF's expected points model, he was supposed to have 25.6 points. So he was supposed to have a huge day because of those 13 targets. He had really good usage again with Tyrod Taylor moving forward. I'm actually really excited about Brandon Cooks, you know, as a top 24 guy, he might even be in the trade targets video this week. He is fourth in target share with cup Debo Samuel, Devontae Adams. I mean, as long as he gets a little bit better quarterback play, we're talking about an absolute stud. Then our ninth takeaway is Nick Sirianni hates your football teams. He hates your football teams. After leading on Boston Scott, so last week, even though I said from the get-go, 
I don't understand. Kenneth Gainwell is their best running back on the roster. They have Jordan Howard, Boston Scott, Kenneth Gainwell. In my opinion, Kenneth Gainwell is the best running back on their roster last week. Or here's the crazy part. Let's actually jump back two weeks. All season long, it was Miles Sanders. It was Kenneth Gainwell with Boston Scott as a healthy scratch and Jordan Howard on the practice squad. Tell me how Miles Sanders gets hurt. Then Boston Scott and Jordan Howard leap over Kenneth Gainwell in the depth chart. It just makes no sense. Nick Sirianni hates fantasy football. He just hates it. And then last week, he gives Boston Scott the entire workload in the meaningful part of those of that Lions game. But instead, this week, he gives Jordan Howard, you know, workhorse-type opportunities, 17 opportunities of 29, only giving Gainwell two touches. It just makes no sense. Also, his pass-to-run ratio was really weird. I don't think that this is the right thing. Oh, yeah. His pass-to-run ratio is really weird. He was abandoning the run with Miles Sanders. He was throwing the ball a ton, right? So he had the sixth lowest neutral run rate through six weeks, 36%. Then week seven, 58%, which really climbs up. Then 68%, then 70%. So now he's running the ball at a crazy rate. He was running the ball 36% of the time through six weeks. Now in the last two weeks, he has ran the ball 68 to 70% of the time, almost doubling his running plays. And the wildest part is, is that through six games, he had Miles Sanders, who you can say whatever you want about Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders is a pretty dang good running back. Then he gets hurt. And now with Jordan Howard and Boston Scott, we are leaning on the run game. It just makes no sense to me. It just makes no sense. And it's not like he's winning football games because of it. He won against the Lions, but I mean, like, who's not winning against the Lions? Then our last takeaway of the week is David Bell, wide receiver one. Now, it's super early. I haven't sat down, looked over all of the prospects uh, that are eligible for 2022. I will be doing that in the offseason. But, you know, I watched a little bit of college football on Saturday. I already have a couple of ideas about wide receivers. Like, I know, you know, I know about where my top five is I don't do Debbie but I know about where my top five is I know you know I've done a little bit of research here and there just to kind of get familiar with these guys but David Bill is David Bell is a stud man he had 11 catches for 217 yards and a touchdown against the number three ranked team in the nation Michigan State they ended up beating Michigan State and he has one of the cleaner prospect profiles I've seen right from a prospect profile perspective, right? Somebody like me that looks at the numbers, the breakout age, all that good stuff. This is receiving yards per team pass attempt. One of the best metrics we have for wide receivers. I compared him to Rashad Bateman and CeeDee Lamb because I, I looked at his profile and he instantly made me think of them because they are, you know, just really, really, like I would almost call them like purebreds. Like they broke out at age 18 and then they just continued dominance throughout. Those are wide receivers we want to pl- pace all, or place all of our bets on. David Bell fits that. He broke out at age, or not at age 18, but he broke out as a freshman like Rashad Bateman, like CeeDee Lamb, and then just continued dominance throughout. Remember, as a as a freshman, I believe that Rondell Moore was there in year one and year two, but you know that those were the years where Rondell Moore was hurt all the time, but still he was there at times. Regardless, David Bell, really, really solid wide receiver prospect. I have him at wide receiver one right now. Again, I haven't done a deep dive, but I would be shocked if he fell outside of my top three. He looks like the next Rashad Bateman. Now, draft capital will be another thing. Draft capital seems like the draft guys like Mel Kuyper, all those guys like, you know, guys like Garrett Wilson, Olave, all of those guys ahead of David Bell. So he might be like a, you know, a round two, round three guy, but I still love me some David Bell. Now that is going to do it for us today. This one ran a little bit longer than I thought it was going to. I'm going to go upstairs, make some lunch while this video is downloading, and then it will be in your laps off the hot press. I hope you guys had a great weekend. I love you guys. We hit 7,000 subscribers. I can't thank you guys enough. I talked about it in like the last video, but still, just absolutely insane to see 7,000, 7K on the YouTube site. Like this is like, it's, it's wild fellas. Um, so I appreciate all you guys, all you guys that made it to the end of this video. I'll be putting out, um, two waiver wire videos tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. We're going to have some dynasty videos at the end of this week. So be on the lookout for all of that fellas. As always, I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one.